Awesome. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to another session. Uh, always happy to see so the the grid well so well populated with for such a arcane topic. Um, so so last week we looked at spiking from the perspective of the story of how people how Hodgkin and Huxley eventually succeeded in modeling it. I, um, history was already quite a bit, but there's a whole lot of interesting details which I'm still sort of learning. And I should say, with this topic, I'm I'm far from an expert, just an enthusiast. So uh, a lot of things I'm just learning at the at like right now, even today. So it's all just you know, in case I, I say something that is not quite right, or or just jump in if you know, or if you spot something. And if you're curious about something that you'd like to dive into, I'm happy to uh, like, you know, go down a rabbit hole later. <laughs> so, so I really enjoy doing that sort of thing. So even if I can't answer you, happy to dive in later. So to recap, right now. Okay, so, so there's a couple of different ways we can think about uh, approaching uh, spike-like behavior in a simplified model. Uh, and Richard Fitzhugh kind of does both, but we'll do the first um, way. So you start with the experimental data, which in this case, the, the really good stuff came from the, the squid giant axon. Um, you then use some principles to reduce the number of dimensions, if you can, because in the case of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, it's four dimensions, so you can't really visualize it. And, uh, and then you look at the simpler system. So it's like going to from the real squid to a cartoon squid. And in parallel, and historically this was happening in parallel, you have um, a whole story of nonlinear oscillators happening at the end of the 19th century. Um, and so you can think of this as going from simple to more complex, going in the opposite direction, just adding things um, to make them a little bit more like spiking systems. And then again, you compare your uh, steampunk squid with the real phenomena. So just a reminder, this is the system that we started with. <clears throat> the, um, or we did, we got ended up with at the end of last time. And most of you I'm sure don't have that much experience with this. Even though I've been working with this for years, it scares me <laughs> because I always find something new about, uh, uh, when I work with it. And there's all, there are all these little quirks, um, especially when you add the more interesting currents um, there's, all, there's a whole zoo of weird potassium currents, for instance, and of course, plenty of calcium currents. But the basic property uh, of spiking, here I've shown a, a step input uh, transiently causing a spike. One thing that uh, I often forget because I work so often with simplified models is that the, the downswing of the action potential is slower than the upswing. A lot of simplifies, mo simplified models don't have this. Now, this is a re it's just a couple of milliseconds, so it's not clear how important something like that is, but it's something that I uh, always notice, this sort of shark fin shape when you look in closely, shark dorsal fin. Uh, but anyway, so we'll so since we are thinking of comparing the properties of the Hodgkin-Oxley model with the simplified model, which is coming, I thought we'll just work through, step through some of the properties of the model that um, are salient and which uh, Hodgkin and Huxley and Cole and, and Laurenta Deneau and a whole lot of others started to collect from, from the, let's say the 20s on through the, the 50s. <clears throat> and I, I haven't dug into this, but I, what I'm showing you is all stuff that from the Hodgkin Huxley simulations that I ran and which are mentioned in the text. They don't often, they don't always cite where they, the, that particular observation was found in, in the animals. But uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that all of these properties have been observed in animals. So um, again, just a single spike. And on the, on the, so I'm showing the membrane potential, which is what uh, the, is the spike, the input, the three gating variables. So just to remind everyone, the um, M is the uh, opening of the, of the sodium channel. So the sodium rushes into the cell. So that causes the increase in the voltage. Uh, and then you have two slower uh, gates. You have H, which is the uh, shutting of the sodium channel, and N is the opening of the potassium channel. So the net effect of, of um, H is to prevent further entry of sodium, and the net effect of 
N is to repolarize the cell back towards its membrane potential. Uh, and as you can see, it's much, much slower than the rise time of the sodium opening channel. So um, anticipating what Fitzhugh is going to do, uh, we are going to just plot two of the four dimensions uh, on, on, the, on the right. So that I have the membrane potential along the x-axis and the inactivation gate uh, on the uh, y-axis. So roughly you can think of this as the, the two kind of push-pull phenomena that can be uh, discerned in this particular um, oscillation. In this case, it's just one excursion. Uh, and in these plots on the right, green is where I start it and red is where it ends. Clear. Yeah, just just interrupt uh, if, if you want me to go over anything uh, in more detail. Um, okay, so a key property of spiking is refractory periods. There's an absolute refractory period and uh, a relative refractory period. So you can sort of make out what that is right from here. But basically, uh, when a spike has already been triggered, there's a, a time zone roughly corresponding to the period when the sodium channel is inactivated, when you can't do anything to the membrane potential. It's, it's sort of locked out of, it's unresponsive at that stage. And then you get to a, a region where the, um, uh, there's a little bit of possibility of, take, uh, of taking in some sodium uh, ions. And so that's the, uh, so you have the absolute refractory period and the um, relative. And this is just showing two of those loops. And, and this shows that um, with a sufficiently strong input in the relative refractory period, you can get a little bit of um, a rise in the membrane potential. And uh, this general point uh, is, is something that um, is worth making. Some people think of it as nitpicking, but when people simplify what the brain is doing, they often describe spikes as uh, uh, on or off or all, all or nothing signal, but they aren't really on or, all or nothing signals. Um, there are small regions of the state space where you get sort of mini spikes. Um, and, and as you can see, if you zoom in close enough, they're not discrete discontinuous phenomena, they're smooth. So these are sort of edge cases, uh, like unusually shaped spikes, but it's worth keeping in mind because they, they, there are situations when that they may be important for understanding uh, signaling. So here we see classic rhythmic spiking. So I've just turned on some input and held it at that point. Um, the gating variables are all the same. So um, as you can see, the system shifts completely downwards to, to this new kind of zone. Um, and uh, I guess some, those of you who've worked with dynamical systems more or less know why this is, but you could say that the input kind of determines what the phase plane is. So it's not the same phase plane for the system with input and the system without input. So it's sort of shifting the whole system. And that's one way to think about it. Uh, and we'll see some more figures showing that. Um, another property, uh, which is crucial for all of these um, nonlinear oscillations is stability. And uh, I feel like a lot of these uh, uh, treatments don't, don't show it in a way that, that people can see. I always like to do this, which is I set up my stable oscillation and then I insert uh, uh, either an increase or a decrease in the input. And um, you can sort of make out what has happened. I've uh, so most of the trajectories are sort of overwriting each other. So there's multiple um, action potentials in this main sort of triangular shape. And there's this one trajectory where things have been bumped and then everything goes gets back on. So you can think of this as, as that the overall shape of the action potential and the frequency, um, it, I haven't shown that, but the frequency also is the same. And what you end up with is a sort of phase, phase shift. So we, uh, it's, um, the, the stability is of the shape of the, of the oscillation and the frequency, but the phase can shift. Um, as a result of these perturbations. So you can speed up or slow down uh, one of the spikes. And that's something that you don't come across too often in, in, a lot, in modeling treatments, mainly because people inject very noisy input. But again, something that could potentially prove to be useful. Uh, I don't know. That the, 
the y-axis in these plots? How do I think about this quantity? Um, the inactivation gate is the um, quant. Uh, it was a at the time of Hodgkin and Huxley, it was a phenomenological uh, approach um, motivated by the, the voltage clamp kind of uh, experiments. But basically, the idea is that the um, once the sodium starts rushing in, there's this uh, the ability uh, for the permeability basically shuts down. And so the channel closes and that this captures the dynamics of the closing of the uh, sodium channel. That's what that is. And this is a limit cycle, right? In the, um, yes. on the right panel. And so the middle is a repeller and then the outside is sort of an attractor towards that limit cycle. Well, the term. Well, there, there will be an attractor. So, if you looked at uh, at the um, Strogatz book, there's, they talk about something, the um, Poincare Poincare Bendixson theorem, and that's one of the more reliable ways to to show that there is a limit cycle, which is uh, a stable oscillation. And one of the there are some requirements for for that, which is an unstable attractor in the middle, and uh, so let's say that I'm interested in a, in a, the region, like imagine that I've sort of thickened the, the blue line so that I'm interested in a kind of ring, a donut that includes that, um, the shape. Now, if there are no, and so there's a hole, the hole has to have a repeller and the region surrounding this has to have no fixed points. Um, now the, the next criterion is the one that's a little tricky. You have to show that there is a closed trajectory of some sort in that region. And if you check off all these criteria, um, uh, and then there's one, and then show that all the points on the outside of the donut, the vector field points inwards, and because of the repeller on the inside, we know that the vector field points away on the inside, you know that I, I, in a finite time or in infinite, or you know, as T goes to infinity, you land on a limit cycle. So that's what a limit cycle Kind of is. I, I'm not 100% sure if there are limit cycles that don't obey this criteria. Ryan, you might know more about that. But I, I, I'm, I don't know enough about this to, to comment on that. Usually, this, like if you've identified a periodic orbit, uh -huh. this, this, the study of stability kind of uh, involves like looking at small perturbations and analyzing how those small perturbations grow as you go around one period. Okay. Yeah. And so you can define a, like a Lyapunov exponent for every direction normal to the cycle. Mm -hmm. And if those are all negative, then there is this like uh, trapping region that you're right. talking about. If right. you take a small enough neighborhood. Yeah. So, so um, Strogatz kind of gestures at that, but I think the math is a little sophisticated. So, so you can have I, like, I, you know, semi stable, you could have ones that are like, I don't know, maybe fine tuned. Uh, that don't have a trapping region, perhaps. Oh, interesting. Okay. Hmm. So, that, like, kiss. You could imagine like a stable limit cycle that like just kisses an unstable limit cycle. Ooh, something okay. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I don't know. Now that I think of it, um, Himanchu has experience with this too. Like, there are some systems where you can you can tweak the parameters in various ways to get a cycle, and then outside that range, there's no cycle, and then you find somewhere else in the parameter space, in a disjoint region of the space, a similar cycle shows up again. Um, so I, I, I've noticed that in a few places. Yeah, these cycles can kind of just disappear. It's a little bit annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of, luckily most of us in grad school didn't have to fit uh, nonlinear oscillations, but, but if you did want to do that, it was, there was a lot of parameter tweaking to be done. Um, That's fun. <laughs> like uh, it's like my metaphor for model modeling. Uh, it's probably not recommended, but I used to think of the model as some sort of wild animal that I was trying to ride on and get a feel for it, because uh, I didn't necessarily use any fancy analytic tools to uh, to study it. And I'm not sure that it would be possible even to do that properly. But uh, you tend to get some intuition when you play uh, with parameters, at least in some regions of the state space. Yeah, sometimes like this limit cycles, I tend to think of them as like almost like eddy currents nice. in a turbulent space. So they're not like the rule, but like the exception sometimes in your in, in your state space. So yeah. if you happen to land on them, then that's great, but they may not be there next time. 
yeah, it's like a little valley surrounded by like the you know like uh, all kinds of jagged uh, things. But it is a valley, so so it is stable. Um, although that metaphor is a little hard to work with cycles, so you have to watch out for that. Yeah, like maybe in the interior of this cycle has like something complicated going on, but maybe there's like no biophysical way to like access it. Right, right, yeah. So, so one thing that's sort of a semi point, semi question, <laughs> <laughs> semi everybody, some people already realize this, but I just want to, um, so this isn't really the dynamical system. Right. Like, yeah, this is, uh, so, uh, I will come to that. Yeah. So, so talking about limit cycles and stuff like that here is, is although it's like the same phenomena sort of, and like the simplification of this system might have the same features. It's sort of a, a little bit, I don't know if it's technically correct <laughs> in yes, like it, some it, it isn't. formal in fact, sense. I'm going right? to, yeah. Um, so um, that's really, um, it's like kind point. of. A nitpicky thing but but I mean obviously it is essentially that but it has the same behavior but um um yeah you're yeah, just I, saying I, because I, I the, that plotted up. here is like a projection of the 4d model of the 4d yeah it, it's not really a projection though because it's only two variables so it doesn't oh, even projection include... into two dimensions I mean well we'll, we'll, well come guess, to a projection yeah. soon <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a projection that doesn't include information from two of the variables. Yeah, right. We'll see that one too. Projections we'll... normally do. Some projections. <laughs> yeah, for, some projections do pre preserve. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, but, yeah, we'll see that soon. Partly, so, partly a question. <laughs> not yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good point, and and it's one that uh, I'm still like not completely clear on how Fitzhugh did what he did. So we might be able to talk about that more. But yes, I'm plotting this year just to get a feel for what the variables are because um uh, eventually we'll move to the more abstract system um so just knowing what these things look like in the real system you know is, is good prep because yes this is not uh, a phase plane and and uh, we have to sort of be careful about that because we're looking at two of the four dimensions only and that's really important um we talked about this or did we uh, yeah so rebound excitation is when you have no input and then you have negative input and when you remove the negative input, the, the, the system spikes. Um, I always got gotten a kick out of <laughs> the existence of this type of thing. Uh, it's sort of the rubberiness of, um, of, a, of a membrane in the electrical space. Um, and uh, excitation block, which we sort of mentioned in the email thread. So if um, the excitation is large enough, eventually, um, you get uh, you start to damp down on the size of the action potential, and eventually you get nothing. Um, so here, uh, one way of doing that is to have a steady ramp. Uh, another phenomenon which Hodgkin and Huxley um, noted in their paper, which I pitch you also model, but I won't talk about it again. So let me mention it now: is if the ramping rate is slow enough, and however high you um, get with the current, uh, you won't produce a spike which is again, a reflection of the nonlinear currents. They, they kind of, so it's not, so it's, these are all ways of understanding that the system is not an input output device in the traditional sense. The, temp, the timing of the inputs matters. So there's a sense in which it is, even though it's very, it's you know, not that complicated, it's a highly contextual system. There's, there's, there, um, hysteresis is, is a big part of it. Um, so another question slash thing. Um, is this um i've seen this in models before um but is this ever observed physiologically yes, yes i have a, there's a plot for this too yeah okay yeah i haven't checked all of them but this one just happened to be in the um it's a uh, book but uh hodgkin and huxley mention it and so there's there's a lot of stuff that was collected in over the course of the 40s and probably also in the 50s um, with these properties that they were recording in the squid uh, and also the frog. Uh, and I, I don't know what other model animals they were using at that time, but, uh, but it's a couple of different groups were looking at this, we're working at the detailed properties of the actual axon. Um, so as, as you just said, what we were looking at was not the face plane because the actual face space is four dimensional. So, 
just to anticipate what what Fitzhugh did, we'll we'll the, um, I'm going to point out a couple of things. Well, if you look at m and and minus v, and the reason it's minus v is a uh, to do with conventions in the 50s, but and h versus n, uh, you see. Well, in h versus n, you can see is this almost a linear relationship, and that's something that Fitzhugh uses. Here, you can see that it's not quite that, but uh, uh, for reasons that I'm, not, I'm, I'm fully understood, Fitzhugh felt confident of, of doing a particular projection, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, so that's Richard Fitzhugh. Um, and he uh, didn't do what uh, Huxley did, which was crank out numbers with that uh, hand calculator. He worked with an analog uh, computer, and this is super cool, which I didn't really know about. Um, so, and the reason was he wanted to be able to change things and look at what happens in in real time, basically. Um, so uh, he starts the 1960 paper with some good motivation, especially for people who aren't too familiar with this style of uh, of modeling or, or just thinking. Um, there's some misunderstandings of the rather compl complex mathematical properties which form the basis of the model's physiological <laughs> behavior, but which are not at all obvious on a first examination of the equations. So this ties into um, emergence in a way, which is something we, we several of us talked about a lot last year, which is this idea that, well, one of the ways that people talk about emergence is that you have a similar uh, uh, phenomenon in very different uh, substrates. And if, if it's meaningful to ask, well, why, does, why is it similar? Then you can't get too hung up on mechanistic details of sodium and potassium. And uh, that's sort of a guiding um, principle in dynamical systems thinking, which is there's these broad qualitative similarities, but we can still talk about them uh, with a kind of causal perspective. And in some sense, we get a deeper understanding of the necessary interactions that produce the qualitative behavior. So it's like stepping away from reality to sort of see commonalities across different uh, phenomena. So I was just curious, I, I just pulled this out because uh, I, I didn't really know how or what exactly an analog computer was. They actually used op amps and integrated circuits to do the differentiation and integration and all of that. It's like, kind of awesome because in some sense, people who were in engineering and physics undergrad would have been able to make this. Probably not well, but but like like we we could make this with breadboard, right? Like um, it's it's um, it's pretty awesome. And in those days, it was those huge computers with vacuum tubes and and old school op amps. So he didn't want to wait around for the digital computer where you had to schedule your simulations and you couldn't sort of do what we do, which is play around with parameters. So he used this uh, analog device. It's quite impressive. Um, so, uh, what Jesse was talking about was this projection question. Now, any projection necessarily loses information. So whether it's using one dimension or some combination of them, however you do it, going from four dimensions to two dimensions involves a loss of information. But you can motivate a doing, having a good projection that captures as much of the qualitative behavior as, as, you, as you can. And in this case, the uh, H plus N being roughly a straight line was one projection that, that he used to get rid of one dimension. And this other one is a little bit more complicated, but basically even though they're not a straight line exactly, that he projected the um, uh, V and uh, M onto a single quantity. And you can see what he's done here. He's, he's changed his variables to U, which is V minus 36 M, and W is half of the difference between N and H. So you moved into this new lower dimensional space in order to look at the, at the qualitative uh, behavior of the system. This, this is the part that's really quite, uh, quite interesting and I, have not, I haven't seen this sort of analysis elsewhere. So I don't know, um, uh, I haven't seen an, another example, so I don't know what exactly the principles are that he's applying and his writing is a little obscure, so I don't uh, always get it. But it's, it's a very interesting, uh, simplification. And so, so as we said, this is not a phase plane. This is a pseudo phase plane, but um, you can still characterize it uh, as we've done phase, phase spaces, phase planes in the past where 
based on the qualitative description of what's happening in each region. Some of these terms are from his 55 paper. So QTP is quasi threshold process. So um, in the early days, people thought that the action potential was a threshold phenomenon, meaning the input had to be of a certain value. And related to what I was just saying about uh, the variable size of the action potential is that it's not quite a threshold phenomenon. So threshold is not the right term for it, which is why he says QTP, quasi threshold phenomenon. So that's the state diagram um, of the projection, not a phase plane. Um, and he points this out. The U UW plane is not a phase plane uh, since each of its points in, is a projection of a plane in the four space. An infinite number of values of u dot and w dot will in general exist at that point. Um, so we're definitely losing information. But as we will see, uh, we still retain quite a bit that's interesting about the quali qualitative nature of spiking. So I thought, uh, step back a bit and place oscillations in some context, because again, this is something that wasn't obvious to me until recently. Um, I think everyone has some notion of what vibrations are or oscillations. And, um, but uh, it's interesting that even though people you know, could see vibrations and, and all that, the mathematical kind of understanding of it was relatively recent. Um, so that's, I found this lurid picture of Robert Hooke. <laughs> um, but, um, but you can see there, there's a spring and, uh, so he understood, he didn't understand the dynamics of this, but he understood that the force that's uh, restoring a spring back to um, the center is proportional to the extension. So the amount by which you uh, extend it from equilibrium. And when you just plug that into uh, Newton's law, F is equal to MA, you get an equation. And the solution of this is a sinusoid, a perfect uh, sinusoid. Um, so, when you can go from there to the wave equation by taking Hooke's law and uh, basically uh, kind of doing an uh, infinitesimal limit of many little springs uh, connected to each other in series. So now you can add space to the temporal aspect of the oscillation. And that's the famous wave equation that uh, D'Alembert uh, first derived in one dimension. And here you see uh, this is a, a one-dimensional traveling wave. It's bouncing off the ends of, of, of something that's clamped. So here, this is space. This should be obvious, I guess. And here's a 2D version. Uh, and even though you know the, uh, you don't necessarily see that there's the sinusoids in the in the 2D case, um, these are linear waves. And what that means is that the sums of solutions are also solutions of the um, of the equation. And this makes life very easy. And this relates to Fourier analysis and stuff like that. And uh, a, a more uh, sort of sophisticated point is that this relates to conservation of energy. And uh, we have mentioned this in the past actually, but so when there's conservation of energy, you don't see limit cycles. What you see are uh, nodes and centers. And centers means that if you add energy to the system, you just move to a new so, uh, cyclic behavior. So that's linear oscillation. Um, and then there's a, and then we have damped oscillations. So I'm just working through how we get there. That's the normal harmonic motion. And here's the damped harmonic motion. So you add some friction, which is proportional to the velocity. I believe this was discovered or, or posited just from experiments. It's not always true as we, I think we mentioned uh, one earlier. Um, and with a change of variables, um, you can write this simple system in terms of mu, a parameter that we'll be using um, a few times. And you'll see uh, a damped oscillation. It starts to move and then it loses the energy to friction and the oscillation goes away. I think everyone's familiar with that general phenomenon because that's much more likely than anything else. Um, so, now, where, so the story of nonlinear oscillations is quite quite interesting, and I only recently kind of dug into this. But um, as it turns out, uh, the story uh, links to electric lighting. Um, there, there were uh, carbon arc lamps were starting to be used in the late late eighteen hundreds for uh, public street lighting, and as it turns out, they made a horrible racket 
uh, uh, which is what which people hated. And so they hired, uh, I think in, in London, they hired this person, um, William Dubois Duddle, um, to fix it. He, he was a physicist and engineer. And so he built a circuit. He basically discovered um, that, that you could um, to compensate for this with this other circuit. But then he discovered that you, oh, I can generate um, an, uh, an oscillatory behavior with a DC current. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're curious, you, this, this paper is quite good. It came out only in 2012 and it goes through some of this early history um, prior to the Van der Poel oscillator. So then there were several people working with different kinds of electrical circuits and sort of you know, putting them, them together and seeing what happened. And they, they found all kinds of strange uh, oscillations, less and less like sinusoids. And I forget which one was the musical one, but, but, so, but they were, as, as Ryan was saying, when we just started, there were some chaotic uh, uh, oscillations also observed, but not in this diagram though. And so several people in France and England were, were looking into this experimentally. And a few people were writing down the differential equations, basically looking at the circuit that they had made and using um, Kirchhoff's laws. Fairly, fairly straightforward to set up the differential equations for these systems. Um, and then, uh, who, who, who am I talking about, first of all? Does anyone have, other than Himanshu, does anyone have a guess? It's um, Henri Poincaré, who basically invented the whole field of uh, uh, qualitative dynamical systems theory during and right after his PhD thesis. Uh, right before he invented the field of topology, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around that time, yeah. <laughs> what a guy. And then so, discovered special relativity. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure Jesse can translate what that title is, but I think everyone can guess what it means. I guess and, uh, Corb might be a little tricky. Um, so memoir, I guess, means memoir treatise on curves defined by a differential equation. Um, so he looked at one of the uh, musical arc uh, circuits. So, so I believe that if, if it wasn't collect, uh, trying to uh, being used to compensate the electric lighting, you could use it to just generate sounds. And uh, it made me think of some sort of like Victorian synth pop, <laughs> which, which someone could you know make with these circuits. Uh, but there, there's some demos of, of the actual buzzing from the arc lamps, and it sounds horrendous. Uh, but uh, you can find it on the website I linked to. Uh, so, so Poincaré looked at this and wrote down the differential equations and found that they indeed have limit cycles, which are, which he invented the concept or, or discovered it, if you like. He, he coined that term and he gave a series of lectures on it. So um, what is the arc? It's like a spark gap? I forget how I, I exactly it works, but it was different from the filament lighting. Might have been a spark gap, yeah. Um, but yeah, in this, so in like this the paper. voltage gets high enough and it just jumps the gap or something in this circuit. Mm, probably that's where an arc lamp is, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Cool. So apparently, a bit of horrendous racket, which you can hear if you like. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, I'm skipping. There's several people who are working with all sorts of different systems, uh, metal wires, and there was all kinds of tinkering going on, partly because. It was a wireless world. Uh, people were getting really excited about radio. And uh, so there was you know, lots of hobbyists and then and also the scientists uh, and physicists were, I mean, a lot of people were looking into this. And Balthazar van der Poel, uh, awesome name, <laughs> uh, this, uh, wrote uh, a paper on this. He was at uh, Philips at a time when it was called Philips Glow Lamp Works. So the lamp is a common thread uh, in all of this. Um, and um, so he uh, came up with the concept of relaxation oscillations, which he published the same basic, the, the same paper basically four times, uh, twice in Dutch, once in English, and once in German. But but it is a, a pretty solid, simple, well put together paper. So I can see why he was very proud of it. Um, so, and a question that always was in my mind was, what does it have to do with relaxation? The answer is that 
uh, as is with, as is the case with charging up a capacitor. The idea is that when that you stress something and then allow the stress to dissipate, it, it relaxes. And that's a concept that Maxwell came up with in the context of stress um, in a viscous fluid. So just a little science etymology assigned there. So, um, so Van der Paul was looking at oscillations potentially for use in radio uh, and then he simplified some circuits and came up with something, but let's see how he sort of got there. So we've looked at dissipative um, oscillations. So here I'm looking, these are actual phase planes because I'm looking at a two dimensional system. This uh, one dimensional second order system can be with a change of uh, variables turned into a 2D uh, first order system, which is uh, Strogatz talks about that. And um, in, in normal damping, mu, the damping uh, coefficient is positive. So Van der Paul starts by thinking about, well, what would you expect to happen if the, you flip the sign of that? And you know, what would you expect? So if on the left, I have positive damping, actual damping, everything goes down. Uh, if I flip that around, you get uh, oscillations get larger and larger and larger. Now, how large can they get? There's a limit to how much energy. So, so a key idea here is that if friction means you're uh, taking energy out of the system, the system is losing energy in the form of heat, well, what's happening here is you're injecting energy into the system. So that can't go on forever. And so Van der Paul modified the damped harmonic motion to get self-sustaining oscillations that didn't go up, blow up to infinity. Um, so, so basically, he uh, he explains it quite simply here. The, um, the solution he's talking about is the blowing up to infinity is physically unrealizable. And so for actual physical systems, the differential equation will only be valid for values up to some value. So that means that, that negative damping, which is accelerating uh, upwards can only uh, kind of has to shut itself off. Um, and then, so that means that that itself is a function of the amplitude. So instead of a scalar quantity, a, a constant mu, he replaced it with one minus X squared which means that it's um, negative in uh, for small x and positive for large x. I hope I wrote the sign right. But basically the idea is that if it gets too large, it, uh, the damping becomes like normal damping and for small values, it's pushing the system outwards. And he's, here are his plots. This epsilon here is what we've been calling mu. Um, so you see that for different values, uh, you get, uh, it, it grows to a level and then it stabilizes at a particular size. For small epsilon, you might not necessarily realize that this is not a sinusoid. And he shows that as you increase epsilon, you get um, these more and more highly nonlinear, fast, slow dynamics kind of oscillations. And he plotted them um, on the, in the phase space. But um, these are not. This is not the standard phase plane that we've usually drawn. There's a small difference, but it's an interesting difference. Does anyone know what these things are called? These lines. They, they look quite cool. They're isoclines. They're uh, points for which the derivative takes on the, the value written, and uh, so the isocline for which the value is zero is the null cline. So that's another way of looking at uh, the uh, dynamics of the system. So in this case, the null cline um, is one of those isoclines. Uh, it's just a sort of mathematical footnote, but, but as, so this is the same three uh, oscillations. Uh, it's not a squashed aspect ratio. This is actually what it looks like. <laughs> um, so basically uh, as you increase this parameter, you get these more and more nonlinear um, fast, slow kind of oscillations. And uh, we won't really talk about topological equivalence, but the idea, this is basically the idea that there is something in these systems that is similar, even though uh, the, the, the specific geometry and the shape are different. 
So when we talk about qualitative similarity, uh, yes, and there's an element of we eyeballed it and it looked the same, but there is actually a, a more formal way of talking about qualitative similarity, um, which I don't know all that much about, but uh, it takes you into the domain of topology. So to topological equivalence is the idea that you can smoothly deform uh, a trajectory to make it into the other trajectory. And when you can't smoothly deform, then you have bifurcations, when something new basically starts to happen. So uh, what did Fitzhugh do? He took the Van der Poel oscillator and um, transformed it uh, into something similar. He added an input because uh, the neuron is not just a natural oscillator. It usually needs an input in order to do anything. Uh, and, and this is what we were talking about earlier. It, it's, there's a slight difference with this equation because both V and W show up in, in this here. Um, part of that is probably some phenomenological fitting, but, but he did motivate it uh, with his projection. I say not necessarily because he doesn't have to oscillate. Um, and Nagumo, Jun Junichi Nagumo, a year after Fitzhugh published uh, an equivalent circuit, which is uh, governed by the same equations. So that's why it's called Fitzhugh Nagumo. They weren't collaborators. I, I don't think they were aware of each other, but uh, that, um, it's, that's, why, that's why it's called Fitzhugh Nagumo. All right. So we saw the pseudo phase plane, which was marked with qu the qualitative behavior of the system. Uh, and, and this, this is you know, a lossy projection down from 4D to 2D. And this is the um, phase plane of the Fitzhugh Nagumo system. Now, this is actually the mirror image of the, uh, because of this change in convention regarding voltage. So after, shortly after the Hodgkin-Huxley model was published, Hodgkin himself started using the convention that we now use. So basically the voltage direction is opposite, the current is opposite, the whole bunch of things changed. So, but you should be able to understand the qualitative similarity um, between these, because it's, it's really quite striking. Um, they take, took such a simple system and this projection, I mean, motivated obviously by the desire to make it uh, similar, I suppose, um, captures a whole lot of the qualitative properties of the system. So it's not just about what it looks like, but that it captures a lot of what we're interested in in the actual Hodgkin Huxley system. So now we can talk about these, this phase plane in 2D and we're really talking about the actual system and the exact analysis. Um, so first, just as a check, we, we want to reproduce those properties that we saw in the actual Hodgkin Huxley system. We have the um, uh, excitation uh, block where if then there's too much excitation, the oscillation gets killed off. We have, um, this is a, a rebound excitation. I inhibited it for a while and then released it in the middle. And then you see this spike. Uh, and a key um, point that uh, Fitzhugh makes is that the, this N-shaped null plane, it's the null plane of, of um, the, the, uh, this quantity, um, V, the, the one on the x-axis, is um, N-shaped, well, backwards N, this is orange over here. And uh, the, the position of that null plane will uh, vary depending on what the value of the current is. So changing the system by changing the current uh, is equivalent to shifting this null plane upwards. The more, the more current there is, the more this null plane goes up. Uh, the green uh, null plane is the null plane of the recovery variable, which doesn't depend on the current, so it stays the same. Now, so this is from the whole video, but this shows, this is an animation um, that uh, shows what's happening. So they're gradually increasing the current and you see that you get more or less the same shape, even though it's shifted. Um, but eventually uh, you get a, uh, you, the spike is blocked. So once you reach up here, the spike is blocked. And there's a particular moment at which it sort of, it happens. And uh, that's right there. And we have a word we've already seen for 
what's happening. This is a bifurcation. <laughs> it's the technical term for it is a supercritical and runoff hopf bifurcation. Um, so, uh, so that's um, basically what what this is. And in in our bifurcation language, this is what it looks like. We're we're just sort of labeling what's happening uh, qualitatively. Uh, so the the um, excitation block is when you move in this direction to um, basically quench the system. So yes, and didn't really have that much else to talk about. But oh, okay, yeah. So uh, Jesse asked uh, if this is actually observed, and so this is a piece of data from a rat uh, layer five neuron that shows the excitation block. Um, and also, um, just to uh, reiterate the point about the um, N-shaped uh, null plane, uh, this is another thing that uh, Fitzhugh did really well, and just a little bit sort of of a subtle point. Um, this N-shape, uh, which uh, if you look at, really kind of creates the qualitative behavior, uh, uh, is very clear here. But if you look at the uh, Fitzhugh model and even the reduced model, you don't necessarily see this inflection point or how it works really. So it's it's a, a matter of the, act, the specific scale of it means that you don't necessarily see everything that's happening in terms of the speed. But the basic idea is that there's this place where uh, the V versus I curve, um, which is how you get resistance is negative. So, so if you were plotting uh, an ohmic resistor, the V I curve is just a straight line. So that's like a normal linear relationship. Here, it's not really non-linear, but also in the completely opposite direction. So that's one way to think about um, what the sodium current offers the membrane is, is not just ohmic, but sort of anti-ohmic um, uh, uh, conductance for a very, very brief period uh, captured by this here. And uh, so a lot of uh, the, the uh, Itzkevich book looks into a, lo a lot of different types of oscillations that you can observe in these um, in, in spiking systems. And you'll get similar kinds of things in various sorts of um, two-dimensional systems. And then as you go to more complicated systems, I don't think you can categorize necessarily all the bifurcations. But uh, Ryan probably knows more about some of the higher dimensional bifurcations. Um, so yeah, that's all I had. I had it's a short um, thing because I wanted to make sure that we Sort of ease our way back into the top um, bifurcation topic. And uh, if anyone has any questions, comments? So, does, does anyone know of like studies of the Fitzhu Nagumo model or the Fitzhu model, sorry, um, under stochastic AI? Like, is there a lot of modeling of this sort going on now? Um, with stochastic input. In fact, uh, now, um, like when I model, I use the uh, Izikiewicz model, which is a lot like the Fitzhugh model, uh, but with a reset, uh, which I used to initially think of as sort of cheating, but, but I kind of appreciate what's happening now, which is it, you could think of the space between spikes as the dynamical system, and we're just sort of creating a new one each time. So, so we used to make fun of it a little bit in the early days, but I've sort of reassessed that and I, I kind of like it. There, there, there is some sort of sense to it. Uh, but uh, yeah, nowadays most people add noise anyway to make sure that the whatever qualitative behavior they're uh, creating is not uh, a notch in parameter space I mean, for the higher parameters, for the say the network uh, parameters. But was there some specific type of noise you were thinking of? No, I was just curious if the, this kind of analysis exists and what, yeah, how, how that yeah. works. Yeah. It exists. It, it's, I haven't looked at any uh, lately, but, but there is a lot of that stuff. And a lot of people are working with networks of these kinds of models and coarse graining of these networks. One way to think about uh, noise in your, not in your uh, dynamics, but in the initial conditions which is kind of fun, is to think about in these face portraits, not the trajectory of a single point, but the trajectory of like a blob. 
and to watch how that blob like deforms and does its thing in dynamics in the under the dynamics you know like the second law of thermodynamics kind of says that this blob is always going to spread out you know in a uh, ergodic system but in some of these like the blob can stay together and or it can bifurcate you know it can split into two blobs that end up doing totally different things oh wow is that related to um what's the name of those uh, there's a whole class of stochastic differential equations um that shows that blob spread thing I'm forgetting what it's called just the master equation no, no. are you talking about topological mixing or are you talking about uh, is that what you're thinking about i was not thinking about that i was thinking about blanking on that um Maybe Planck was in the name. I forget. I think you're thinking of the Fokker Planck equation. Fokker Planck, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. So that's what this, that's the same thing where you start, you have a dynamical system and then you convert it into an evolution equation for like a right, right, right. distribution of where you begin. But that's kind of different from having like stochastic dynamics where you at every time step, you know, you also uh, kick the particle a little bit. Yeah. That can cause a lot of crazy things to happen if it's strong. If it's weak then I think you can still do this kind of analysis because it's just kind of like, okay, it doesn't stay on one trajectory, but it kind of stays within the same blob, you know, if the noise is not too strong and if you're not too unlucky that it keeps kicking you in the same direction and you end up on another trajectory. Yeah. But if it's very strong, then you start to get this like crazy kick, like, like these kicked rotor dynamics, like you can get this like deterministic chaos and, well, I guess it's not exactly that, but it's like a, yeah, you can have very different dynamics if you have strong randomness. Do you yeah, have to have like a good reference for where I could just go and read about this? Oh, I don't, but... I can, I can dig up something and send it because there's some, some stuff related to Wiener processes also might be relevant. Um, there's a continuous... I've got, um, yeah, I've got some... Oh. Some figures of uh, on a student's project of mine that might be kind of relevant in, in regard to that. It's the Wilson and Cohen model, but with stochastic drive, and we oh, do right, some yeah. type of bifurcation. I'll just I can quickly show yeah, yeah, some just, basic figures. This and let you share one sec. It really highlights the advantage of this sort of dissection. You can still probe like really complicated network dynamics with, you know, just by probing a single node of the network and what equations govern it, what bifurcations it has, and um, yeah, I can kind of show you, uh, oh. sorry, it's in a, an overleaf document, Wait. but Ooh. can I move this out of the way? Um, so long story short, this is a, a mouse. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, sorry, go. Johan? Yes. John Fries. Are you there? Yeah, you froze for a moment. Mm. Yep. yep. You guys are all frozen. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, is it happening just to me or to you guys? I mean, you, I the I audio it's... got speeded up, slowed down, and then things froze. Is it just my internet connection? Or I think it's just to you, yeah. problem? Mm. Did anyone else have an issue with the speed? No, it's been fine for, yeah. for me. Just me. Yeah. Okay, so Eli, what were you going to say? Um, yeah, sorry about the complexity of this figure. It's unfortunately his figure and not mine, so he needs a lot of work on tidying these up. But long story short, it gives you a gist of what's going on. This is just um, some mouse modeling work. We will, and a lot of people will be using some of these equations and coupling together complicated networks with and uh, adding things like spatial heterogeneity into their models, and they're kind of stuck with this black box model where they can just observe dynamics. They don't know what's, what the perturbations um, are when they add these special heterogeneity um, heterogen into their models. But the pipeline here is basically they have measures of connectivity of a, uh, in a mouse. Uh, I think it's white matter um, density. So they generate a connection matrix for their network. But at each node on the network, the governing equations are the Wilson and Cohen equations. And they, they do some co comparison to functional connectivity here. So for those of you who haven't seen the Wilson and Cohen equations, this uh, these of them here, they just have like a nonlinear function, which is a sigmoidal mapping. Um, but when you couple these together, um, I kind of encourage them to do this dissection of his model, which was before you even build the network, 
what are your what sort of part of state space are your equations in and what are dynamical regimes can they exploit and these are all the same equations but for um he does a parameter sweep of input current on the x-axis here and then the up uh, the y-axis is um city state firing rate for that for the model and you can see for a couple here's four connection parameters but if you pick a set of those and then does a uh, an input current sweep this is the um, where the fixed points are, and on the top regime, you can see for that for that current um, range, he's only got a fixed point attractor. Um, for the second regime, he's got the hysteresis with this uh, multi-stable region in here, and you've got a stable upper and lower branch and an unstable middle branch with bifurcation points. And there, so that tells you that there's a range a range of current for that node where it can be multi-stable. Um, there will be a bifurcation at the boundaries of that re region for it. And when you think of these large networks with stochasticity um, in them, you're um, kind of like what Ryan was saying, there might be some points in time where you, you know, you get just coincidentally collided by a lot of, of high current terms. And that might push you into your um, multi-stable regime. You might experience a bifurcation. Um, you see things like critical slowing near these points. And then the final configuration is actually really cool. Um, and it's uh, got a limit cycle in the middle here. So you've got hot bifurcations for these two values of current. Um, and the, the horizontal lines here, I, I told him to go through and decompose his connect his connectome or his network um, to say, uh, what range of currents would your backbone of structural connectivity provide you? So the, the horizontal lines are kind of saying, if I put the model at a particular uh, set of parameters and then I sweep um, current, where, oh, sorry, if I just put the model at a particular range because of the diversity of connections in the network, um, what, um, where, where would the network sit within? So the idea would be here that if he, um, for one set of parameters, some of his nodes are well away from the limit cycle regime and some are just dip, dipping their toes in. Um, for this um, I3 here, most of them are in the limit cycle regime and some are fixed points either side. And for this final one, the fourth regime, I've never seen a bifurcation done this way, but actually removal of excitatory current allows some network nodes to dip their toes into the limit cycle regime. Um, so that's just for a single node. Uh, this figure is horrible, by the way, but in any case, <laughs> he finds out that um, uh, there's a particular dynamical regime wh which agrees with um, mouse um, functional connectivity data. Um, it's not a massive correlation, but it's certainly um, pretty good. And you can go through and decompose each region relative to their local bifurcation point. And you can see here that the, the mouse, we've grouped the mouse regions on the cortex uh, based on some divisions that people use. But you can see there's this diversity of orientation around their local attractor, um, which I think is a really nice way of thinking about these really complicated um, mm -hmm. networks. So some regions here are operating purely in a limit cycle and have these large oscillations. Some regions are much more stable and look like noisy excursions around a fixed point. And it seems to be that um, uh, the ability for the model to re recapitulate correlational structure um, from empirical data is tied to the idea that you can have this diversity of dynamical regimes. But like, this isn't a perfect paper and certainly not a perfect analysis, but I just wanted to, to highlight the utility of doing the decomposition because someone had raised that point, like when and how could this be useful? Um, and I've, yeah, I've found in this project and others being able to go back and say, all right, there's this complicated network, but at the, the nodal level, what's going on? Because the node at, at a particular time scale can just see network activity as a constant term coming in, um, maybe for like one TR or two TR, depending on how stable your system is. Anyway, that was all I really had to say. Also, there's deformations of the, this uh, landscape when you add another, when you do lots, uh, add in other parameter perturbations. In his case, he's adding um, measures of cell density data. Yeah, yeah, all sorts of cool deformations of this regime. Mm. So you can see the plot here showing which nodes are, some nodes are actually, uh, during the simulations, are dipping their toes in and out of the limit cycle and fixed point regimes. Some are just in one or the other. And then you see all that spatial temporal complexity come out in the rasterized plots. Anyway. That's cool. So does the same, uh, so it's actually something I don't know about, but. So we, we were saying that the any lower dimensional representation is not the phase space, but, but a projection. But how does that um, uh, work with bifurcation? So we're, um, so when we're looking at qualitative changes to a system and we're looking at um, average quantities. Uh, 
is there a formal way to define what bifurcation is, or is it, does it just mean a qualitative change? Um, yeah, I mean, the way, the way it's always been told to me is just like a, a discrete change in the dynamics for a qualitatively smooth shift in an order parameter. I mean, I don't know yeah. if there's anything more rigid than that. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, the, um, you can just see it in, this, in the steady state equation, right? You just solve your differential equations for um, the time independent solutions and you just find these, um, this bifurcation. So that's how he's plotted those lines. Like we haven't done that numerically. We just solve them analytically. Um, ah, nice, okay. Well, I mean, you do do it numerically, I think in those equations, but yeah, it's the, it should be the solution of the steady states. So, so in principle, uh, could you, um, like you uh, infer uh, something about uh, inhibitory time scales from 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 that? Like like does it predict say particular inhibitory fall off times, or, or is it more coarse grained than that? Um, you could get you know, different values of like the, the relationship of PV neurons, which are very pretty fast inhibition versus, or even the ratio of GABA A and GABA B and things like that. Uh, it's asking for a lot, I know, but but it, seemed, it would be interesting to know if there's something you, that. I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly those um, like changes in those um, uh, receptor dynamics and how the, those um, neurotransmission systems work, like will affect. The, in that model, we we don't play around with it at all. But I mean, there are certain form, formulations of of those equations that take that into account. But obviously, it gets like a lot more complicated when you start taking time into consideration. Um, I have worked on some of that different, uh, you know, putting in all the different time scales of GABA A, GABA B, um, you know, the glutamate, and it just gets horrendously more, it gets wet, much more difficult to orient yourself because it's not as simple as like a, a Van der Poel or a yep. Tsunigumo or whatever you're into. Yeah. Um, in fact, yeah. uh, one of my motivations for, for talking about the Hotkin Axley and, and these simplified models um, so much is that Wherever we go from here will be more vague, uh, in particular in neuroscience, uh, because uh, like here is like the high watermark <laughs> of analysis, uh, like dynamical systems analysis in, in in neuroscience, and from here it's more about kind of getting this way of thinking into you because of in my opinion, what I said right at the beginning about transfer functions is one is one of the most important sort of insights that can change the way you think about what a system is doing. Because it's very common nowadays to slice up a ph phenomenon, uh, not just in terms of atoms or, or units of structure, which you kind of have to do, but temporal time slices, sorry, temporal slices. So, uh, and where you say that such and such processing happens in T is equal to one and then T is equal to two, so this happens. And when you assume that all your dynamics take place on one time scale, which is, pretty much uh, like a large number of, of artificial neural networks have just that one dynamic time scale and then a slow time scale for the change of connection weights. But so it's not clear what uh, they would necessarily get out of interesting dynamics uh, in uh, uh, say uh, for, for machine learning and artificial intelligence, but, but for, um, for modeling the brain, uh, in fact, uh, I was thinking that what, what Fitzhugh was, was doing kind of tells us uh, why time is such an important factor. Like when, when he was using an analog computer, he was be able to do something and see exactly what happens and then change a the parameter you know, pretty quickly, right? So there's a sense in which uh, the, the brain's ability to respond to the world is like the sort of a grip, right? Uh, which involves uh, in things like entrainment, uh, in addition to, you know, looks like Johan froze. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Misery loves company. <laughs> Mine has been freezing too. <laughs> I was trying to give you a presentation from 7.30 to 9. I couldn't get through at all. <laughs> Johan said his whole computer crashed. So uh, he'll, he'll oh, have this. We'll be a while before he gets back. No, so that's what happened to me. I, I had to reboot my computer. I had to get, it was kicking me out of Zoom. 
same thing happened in an MIT meeting this morning. There was a person interviewing for a job. I think he was calling from London. They had to issue a new Zoom ID. <laughs> and that meeting invite, I got it now. For 11 o'clock meeting, I got it at 9.25 p.m. I got the meeting invite. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, I had a question for you about uh, the, the manuscript you went over. Sure. Um, so Johan was going over the individual voltage of those uh, single neurons, right? But that manuscript was uh, all about firing rate, right? Each, each yep. node is a single firing rate. So yep. is the um, basic idea to, to use sort of a similar system of equations that were the Fitzhugh Naguma, but for different equations for the firing rate instead of each each node. And that, those were the ones that you showed and when you went over briefly? Yeah, that's right. So that was a, a, a neural field model, which um, I mean, yeah, at some point I'd, I'd be, I'm more than happy to walk through it now, but long story short, you take um, like the local, local voltage dynamics and you make a, an assumption about the statistics of a particular parameter within a population. And that in the Wilson and Cohen um, formulation, it's typically, you know, you know a current, if, you, if you've seen the current activation curve for a neuron, there's, um, you know, for some low level current, there's no firing induced. And then at some, at dis some current value, some current threshold, all of a sudden a discontinuous jump in firing rate occurs. So a neuron begins to fire, um, not in linear fashion, but makes this jump to a, a base level of firing. And then there's some monotonic um, increase to an asymptote of maximal firing rate. It's nonlinear, but it looks something similar to a, to a step function. So it's like the idea that the neuron is not firing for some um, sub-threshold current and then at threshold it fires. If you make that assumption and the additional assumption that um, neurons are weakly correlated, um, so stick, um, uh, independent stochastic processes, you can make, uh, or you can utilize the central limit theorem, which says they'll converge to a Gaussian distribution. Um, and basically you have, uh, a Gaussian distribution of firing thresholds in your population, for example, and you convolve this function with a step function. And what you get is this, this sigmoid. It's a bit of a, a hand wave you say to, um, to say that um, your average um, voltage is related, your average population voltage is related to an average firing rate um, okay. by the sigmoidal mapping function. And, and the, it makes a massive simplification in the mathematics because you're, you, rather than tracking all of these um, like the hodgkin huxley equations for every neuron in your million neuron um, lump in the brain, you only have to track the mean and standard deviation um, of that population. And according to the central limit theorem and the diffusion approximation, that should be sufficient to capture most of the, most of the dynamics. Like the neurons are doing their own thing, but they're enslaved to this large change in mean and variability. And so you use that like what we'd call average the as, as the main thing. So you're actually- That's right. Yeah, so if any time you've seen an, a neural mass model or, or a neural um, field model, they typically only track mean, uh, the mean value. Pretty much no one plays with, um, with variance, but you, wow, you really? should in, in principle. Oh, there's a, as, far, as far as I've seen, no one, no one puts dynamics on the variance. Like the variance must change. It certainly would in the brain. There's lots From of systems that can- From a physicist that perspective, that sounds totally absurd. <laughs> yes, that's right. That is absurd. But it's because they're not willing to deal with that level, the next, next level of complexity. I'm actually fascinated. I don't know if I'm curious just then. Yep. Johan, um, very... my, my question, just to, to fill Johan in, the question was the, the um, difference between individual voltage of single neurons, like the Hodgkin Huxley style, and then this, uh, like in the paper that Eli showed, the mass model of, of the average voltage mm -hmm. and what's that connection there? So, yeah, you uh, can. Yeah, in, in very small models, you can you can start with um, uh, like an Itzikovich model or, or something and scale it up and, and show that the coarse graining does a reasonably good job. The, the assumption of lack of correlation is, is, is a big one <laughs> because you would, you, would, you would think that neurons that are near each other would be, would be relatively correlated. But, but uh, given the success of population coding, um, at least in some areas like motor cortex, uh, it's clear that Something like a size principle and a, and a sort of very coarse um, coding does exist. If there are more fine types of, of coding based on correlation, they 
they, that, that doesn't take away from the fact that there's this, this first order effect is real. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Anirudh sent me a paper uh, that uh, is, uh, was it a review paper? It's, it's on that G JPCA crowd, right? So we could talk, I was thinking that uh, we could do a sort of journal club style session on one of these papers that uh, that is uh, a dynamical perspective for this broader um, uh, sort of way of looking at the brain. It's basically when, when you have those multi-electrode recordings, um, there are methods for uh, uh, looking at how the entire population varies. Uh, some of them are pretty interesting. Kar Karthik has strong opinions about these methods. He's not here, so maybe we can uh, force him to present. <laughs> but um, but uh, but yeah, I, I, um, I haven't I haven't read that paper yet, but it looks pretty interesting. There are. Uh, so is there is there sort of a most common approach to modeling uh, the brain? Is it usually with, um, not, it's usually not individual neurons, right? It's usually a population. Is that the most common uh, dynamical systems approach to anatomical regions and network models? Or because so far we've really only looked at like a one neuron, right? And then when you get multiple regions connecting to each other, you're gonna have the dynamics of each region and then the connections between those regions. Yeah, a lot of times um, people will rely on like an assumption of synchronization between uh, like within cells in a population. And so you can basically like collapse the entire population into one cell. That's like the, um, that that's a kind of a, a trick that a lot of people use, um, but it's not the only way. I mean, I think that the, like everybody kind of has their own, their own approach, not necessarily. I mean, like I, I, I want to say there are like maybe between three and 10 schools of thought on this. Um, and uh, everybody uh, is um, very attached to their own approach. So <laughs> I think that would be an ideal well, thing to discuss. Why would, you, why would you want to do that? I mean, certainly collapsing the whole region to a single cell is like mathematically simple, but it seems like you would lose uh, basically all of the descriptive power. <laughs> <laughs> Is it not true? I mean, yeah, no, that's true. Um, conversely, you could, you know, use like compartmental models and you could say the same thing of like one cell is not enough, right? You can say so. Yeah, it really it's depends really the marriage between the two. Yeah, you kind of want to, like, I'm work, I'm been fortunate enough to work on both scales. Like, I work on the, the neural mass neural field scale, but also at the spiking neural scale, like Azikovich neurons. And, some they have to agree with each other at some level. The assumptions must be so. Like I'm really spending a lot of time trying to find regimes where they they make sense and sort of unite those two scales. But yeah, I mean, there's there's no point in like you know you can always people always come to me and like, oh should we build a model of this? So you can build a model of anything you want. The real question is is it explaining the system you're trying to use it to explain? I spent a long time thinking about how if I take these these you know we've got these large neural networks of really fine scale neural dynamics or Zikovich neurons, these nonlinearities in, in them. And do they behave at a, uh, do their average firing rates across the population behave anything like what we would assume based on the statistics of like the diffusion approximation and using the central th limit theorem? Are they valid? Because those large scale uh, statistical assumptions haven't been well validated at the microscopic scale. They're mathematically tractable and that's why they've become so prominent, I believe. But yeah, they haven't, they certainly haven't been validated, but they are able, as Jaron was saying, to capture a, a lot of large scale phenomena that for a long time had been. Um, people would puzzle over like, you know, large scale oscillations in EEG, like there it is the case that the brain has these persistent rhythms of activity in the brain, um, that, which um, means that the, the fine scale dynamics of a neuron aren't really important to produce that, like they're participating in it, but it's a low dimensional um, um, dynamic, and therefore you don't need this high dimensional representation to recover it. So people do these assumptions and they add a couple of simple structures interacting and lo and behold, you can recover the alpha rhythm as a, a cortical thalamic um, loop. And, you know, there's like the Hoff bifurcation can explain it and away you go. So they've made a lot of progress, but it still remains to be seen whether or not it's always valid. And what I certainly can't explain everything like these, those large scale <laughs> models aren't doing information processing um, and the versions that I've seen of it, but the fine scale is, but they both need to agree, agree with each other. Computation is taking place in this really dynamic large scale, in the, in the bath that is the large scale dynamics. So, you know, when you're doing your modeling, you just mm -hmm. got to bear that in mind. 
yeah, there's there's always going to be some some sort of reduction um, involved. Like um, when when uh, modeling uh, like MEG, we reduce the dendritic tree to you know like three compartments or something like that. Um, and that and that's and that's enough to get a reasonable uh, like uh, magnetic field model from that. Um, but uh, you know, some people kind of insist, like you got the, like the blue brain people who insist on modeling every detail of, of, of every neuron. So um, it's, uh, you always have to kind of make that choice. I mean, you always say they like to do modeling, right? I, 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 the blue brain always, always puzzled me as well, because it's like, you know, if you have the perfect recapitulation of the system, you've built all these equations, describes all the dynamics exactly, you've got every neuron represented, you don't have a model anymore. You just have the brain. You just made it in some other medium. It's like, what's the point? You just left this, this structure you know nothing about. You back to where you started. It's very funny. It reminds me of the Norbert Wiener quote. Uh, the best material model of a cat is an author, or preferably the same cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so there's this approach to modeling, which is just to create the same thing all over again. And then you have to now understand what the model is. So it, which is as complicated as the thing that... But, but there's another way to think about this, which is uh, <clears throat> I like to divide computational neuroscientists into people who study the brain as a phenomenon and uh, the brain as an explanation of a phenomenon, specifically behavior, perception, um, whatever. Now you don't have to do both. It's actually difficult to do both because the uh, very often when you have high quality neural data, the behavioral data is like fairly binary, linear, a couple of you know plots of such and such thing de decreased with uh, injection of such and such. You know, like you don't see a really nice, interesting dynamic on the behavioral side, and matched with something very well uh, characterized at the neural level. There are a few exceptions, like what Himanshu's uh, project was on, the, uh, the grid cell model. There's there's both the dynamics and the neural firing, <clears throat> reasonably well characterized, but that's there's it's fairly rare. <clears throat> so. That actually reminded me that in addition to trying to capture a system and explain the causes, um, there's a whole other way of thinking about dynamical systems from the perspective of control theory. And it might make sense for us to jump into that. Um, I mean, we could maybe spend some more time on, on bifurcation that I don't know the math all that well, or we could uh, maybe dive into control theory. Um, Cybernetics has all of a sudden become fashionable again. I don't know how it happened, but in the past five, six years or so, it's just suddenly the word cybernetics is back. Um, and what that is, is, you know, these different types of controllers for negative feedback and maintain maintenance of homeostasis, heterostasis, allostasis, all these kinds of things. So in addition to, you know, generating oscillations because they're there, which is that first type of thing, right? Model of rain as phenomenon, there is, uh, I know the animal needs to maintain grip metaphorically and literally, right? In a changing environment. So that gives you a, sort of like a normative way of thinking about it, which is this is what the, uh, the system ought to be doing. Um, and I can make a dynamical system using some phenomenological variables of that sort, uh, more relatable to the behavior than to the neural dynamics. The sweet spot is very difficult to, to uh, find, um, so your modeling goals will, will depend on where you're leaning. I, I couldn't help it to you, Johan, um, but we've mentioned the wave equation today. I thought I might just quickly show you um, for those who are interested. Please, yeah. um, these are, if you take that wave equation, um, the Laplace La Beltram operator, and you solve for the eigenvectors you do the eigenvalue decomposition on the geometric surface that is the brain. So you just take the folding of the brain of the cortex and you, using the wave equation, you solve what its modes would be. You get out what's called these canonical spatial eigen modes. So these are like uh, vibrational modes of the brain. So on the right here, you've got the spherical harmonics that we know of from um, those of you who've worked on these sorts of things. Um, on, the, on the left here, we have the um, folded versions of them that, that come out in the brain. And it just so happens if you look at um, uh, the story that you're telling here is that uh, these are like the, the fundamental notes that make up the chords of, of the brain. So you have these basic uh, modes that can be linearly combined because they're orthonormal um, and they can recapitulate a lot of the large scale gradients that are the large scale um, you know, patterns of like covariance if you do principal component analysis. Um, there's other people who have done like 
you know, large scale brain patterns. Like there's these basic modes that, that carve up parts of the brain, like the somato, somato motor. Um, I don't know if I can show you that actually. Maybe I can. Um, if any of you know anything about um, uh, resting state networks in the brain, um, they can be divided up, the correlations in the brain can be divided up into these little zones. But it just so happens that the vibrational modes, they're basically just like small, uh, low dimensional versions of the vibrational modes of the brain. So here you've got like a visual system at the back of your brain and a smarter motor strip. And they can be made up of like the first three vibrational modes. So this is a beautiful story of evolution. Like the brain might have evolved and functionally positioned um, things in your brain based upon the, uh, the actual physical structure and these, these vibrational modes that are present in just its geometry. So it's like that it's easy to to for, for like... the visual and the somatic motor to communicate because they, they sit on the, the upsides of this effective sign function. You can think of it like that. Could there be like a, like normally, you know, if you have uh, any graph or, or even just a sphere that isn't totally round, you'd have a different looking set of uh, harmonics, but maybe there's like a evolutionary principle of parsimony that like you would expect the sphere to be round that like all of the area on the surface of the brain is sort of used equally. Is that mm -hmm. like, I'm just spitballing, but like, yeah. How do you explain that it's the round uh, modes that are important? Oh, sorry. The, I was just showing the, um, we don't actually take the round modes and then fold them up to make it. We solve oh, okay. the, the, do the argument of decomposition on the surface that is the, that lumpy brain there on the left. I just gave the analogy on the right here. Oh, so you actually I'm take a, like a metric associated with all of these like ripples. Yep, that's right. Yep. So the original vision was using the finite element method and then you just do the argument of decomposition of that. And they give, yeah, you get the spatial arguments. And lo and behold, they look very much like all of these large scale um, covariance modes. And I don't know if you guys know a lot about that literature, but that people find these modes and all sorts of, um, all sorts of ways of calculating them. And it's probably just them tapping into these very fundamental physical vibrational modes that you can get at quite easily from, from the wave recovery. Or part of it anyway. This may people apply this kind of idea in the connectome. I mean, like, if you look at it in a graph, you also see interesting structures like the sort of components of the graph become. That's right. So the, gra the graph theory uh, cohort have sort of tapped into that, but because they've, they've um, discretized first and foremost, and then done all of their analysis on top of the graph, it, um, it can introduce all sorts of, for all sorts of problems for you. Like to generate a graph, there's some level of thresholding that go on, goes on. And I think we make an argument here about what the artifacts and the power structure would be if you did things like thresholding. You obscure the dynamics basically. Um, and then, yeah, but they do find these, these sorts of things and um, they're tied to like um, transcriptional gene expression gradients and what have you in the brain all this crazy heterogeneity. But at its most basic level, if you assume the brain was just of this folded geometry and all of it was, it was equal, it was all uniform, the neurons were all the same everywhere on it, you got out these vibrational modes and they look very much like the large scale covariance modes that people find in the brain. In fact, if you do that analysis properly, you can mm -hmm. recover the, them. I've got some work with a colleague that is on its way in that regard. I think that might answer a question that I've, I've had about uh, linear linear versus nonlinear oscillations, which is with nonlinear os os oscillators, when you couple them, they tend to synchronize and not um, add linearly, right? Um, so in principle, uh, is there some sort of way of coarse graining sets of coupled nonlinear equations so that the the net effect at some level of course screening is like a linear, like a sheet, like a linear oscillator, like a, because um, there's something to be bridged <laughs> in, in, in there, right? I'm not sure how to go yeah. about that. Yeah, I saw a poster at Cosine that looked at just uh, Y as a function of tan H X. Uh, so it was just treating it as a sigmoid. And then he, what I didn't get was whether there was any stochasticity in this, but the, the paper is called Is the Brain Macroscopically Linear? It's on BioArchive. Oh, nice, nice. So that's that's exactly have, yeah. yeah, and so they, they're, they're looking at this, but I don't think it was very... I mean, I have my reservations about uh, the way that they went about trying to define um, where, why. So what they found was that linear models were the best models for the data that they had. Okay. Um, is it easy? Of, there, there was an MIT symposium on yeah. linear versus nonlinear, right? Just fairly recently. There's big debate. <laughs> yeah. Is, is that recorded for <laughs> doing a doctor listen to it? They might have put it on YouTube, maybe. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I, 
I, I, I think I have a link. I'll forward it. Evelyn Federico sent it, I think. I'll, I'll forward the link to you, Johan. You can share it with others. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so they had IEG um, and fMRI, um, and they fit uh, different models okay. to both. And, and in That's both cases, they found linear models did the best in terms of model evidence. Right, right. Because my feeling is that some of that um, TMS in sleep and stuff like that might be a, the relevant sort of data. So TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you can in the pulse and the pulse will propagate uh, across the cortex. The extent to which it propagates depends on whether you're awake or not and what state of sleep you're in. So if you're in deep sleep, it doesn't propagate all that much. Um, if you're awake or in REM sleep, it propagates um, quite a bit. So I'm not sure whether that actually answers the question of linearity or not, but, but it does like, um, and in fact, th those things don't even necessarily have to be oscillations, but, but, there's a, the, the, but maybe if you're having some, like multiple of them in a row, you might be able to tell whether there's something slower than linear, faster than linear, something like that. You know, if you had the fundamental yeah, basis set of vibrational yeah. modes and you yeah. plucked a string, you could figure out how those activity would propagate along it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Impulse response, right? Yeah. That's right. So, I think when you're doing brain modeling, you have to start first with the learning process. The output of the learning process is memory. And then when you're going to use the memory, you have two choices. You can have a memory guided task where you're just completely running out of memory or there is another new stimulus stream that is coming in with maybe similar to the memory or uh, another similar stream is coming and you can use this memory as a control system to constrain or guide the processing of the incoming stream. So the memory has two roles. It can be a controller or it can just be a sequential thing that you're just dumping. So if you're using memory if you're looking at a memory guided process, it is totally linear. So if I have memorized a song, I can sing it hundred times exactly the same way. It cannot be corrupted. It's a linear system. But if I'm using memory as a controller, then there is interaction between my inside out memory dumping versus the outside in stimulus coming in. And there is competition and cooperation between the two and that decides how the, the stream is going to be processed. And that's a nonlinear process. That uh, relates to this whole issue of, of um, control theory. And maybe it's a good, I think that may be a good topic yes. to move to. Do, what do people think? Would you like to go through more bifurcation theory or control theory? Because um, we can do, well, no one has any strong opinions I'm leaning somewhat towards what's, what's on the table for a control theory uh like well what, we can uh, just we can look at the classic you know just pid controllers to begin with to, to show how they work um and and maybe even talk about like the, the birth of cybernetics and you know the watt governor and things like that and then maybe look at models of homeostasis in the body and uh, and how uh, sort of, in fact, my, one of my models, even though I didn't do a dynamical analysis, basically works like that. Uh, it's a sort of online er error correction system, which doesn't use kind of uh, memory. It's just sort of responding to what comes in. The, uh, so there, are, there are a few things. In neuroscience, there are a few places uh, not so well known where they use perceptual control theory as, as their main way of thinking. I only recently came across this sub subfield, but uh, there are, a, like, I think whatever math to, tool there is, somebody is applying that to the brain. <laughs> uh, so there's no shortage of uh, ways of- I think, uh, I think walking through a, a example of a dynamical system applied to, uh, you know, one or more than one nodes in the brain applying what we've done so far to something, maybe if, if someone has a simple paper that, or a model that we could tour through and see the dynamics that we've seen for a single neuron, but for uh, anatomical regions or multiple regions, right? See how it changes when you use multiple regions. That would be a, a logical next step, I think, before we, we look at different approaches. So maybe um, 
I'll, I'll look at the paper that Anirudh sent me and then I'll see if there are others because then we can, if it's a review paper, then we can say, okay, they're using this dynamical systems terminology. Do we understand it and bookmark things that we want to understand better? Maybe, maybe that, that's a good thing to do. Um, exactly. And, and see uh, based on how much we, we've already understood whether those papers make more sense to us. I should point out too that a colleague of mine, um, Michael Breakspear, has got a brain dynamics toolbox um, for MATLAB. I think he runs it through, but that has all of like the, I think he's got the Hodgkin Huxley equations, the Zikovich, like just pretty much every flavor of these sorts of dynamical systems that are applied to the brain. And it's really intuitive. There's like sliders you can play around with and look at all the bifurcations, see the phase plots. Um, it's pretty fun. So, uh, insofar as it, people are interested in that, I'm more than happy to share, share a link to it. I'm pretty sure it's free to use. Um, and really, yeah, really intuitive. And it gives you a feel for how, like, what are the, the, the shared properties of these models and what, where are their differences? And you really need to, like Johan was saying earlier on, like, just have a toy, with, have a play with the model, sweep a parameter, get a feel for what it's doing. Um, that was how I learned. I found it so much more enjoyable doing that than just staring at an equation and reading words. Yeah, that, that's what even while reading Fitz, Fitzgerald's paper, I was, you know, sort of coding it up to make sure I could see what, what was happening, you know, in time. Uh, it always helps. Uh, but yeah, we'll, I haven't actually gone much further than the Strogas book, so I'll see if there's some stuff there that we want to pull in also. Um, and yeah, so tentatively, I will say, let's do um, a review paper of some sort that covers more global use of dynamical systems. The Mac, Mac, Mac's paper also has some of, some of that. So, so and maybe we could talk about that, or maybe I'll pull out bits from there too. So, Tentatively, I'll send out a review paper in the next couple of days. And then based on that, we can decide where we want to look into more closely. I also think maybe a nice topic would be uh, synchronization. It's a very interesting uh, from the dynamical systems point of view. And I suppose that there are some uh, biophysical applications as well, right? Yeah, the fireflies and... Um, I mean, in like the brain. Oh, in the brain, yeah, yeah. They use the same model, basically. Um, and uh, in fact, there's a there's a popular. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,